So uh, I've got a selection uh, of questions to ask you both. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll come, to, I'll go to Brighton first and you can, you know, sort of take it in turns. Um, so I've spoken to, I've spoken to Phil before. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question of, of Sarah. Certainly, as you 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 you, you didn't want to you didn't want to do a, a, a sort of forecast of the score this evening, but you came out with that excellent you know sort of quote about you know this the technology uh, you know obviously being a of great benefit to the organisation. So I just really wanted to understand uh, and get a quick answer from you or a quickish answer from you. I mean, how long has how long have Brighton and Hove City Council been using low code? Uh, and more importantly, why did you go down the low code platform route in the first place? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I can answer a bit of it. Phil probably can answer some of the historical stuff. So um, there was already, we already had Achieve um, as a kind of form building tool. Um, there were a number of reasons why the organisation wanted to get rid of that. Didn't really satisfy, you know, some of the ambitions. Um, then there were a number of digital programs that were implemented at Brighton that predated me. Um, the choice of Mendix feels probably best to answer um, because I wasn't there at the time. So I, when I came in, it was already in use. Um, but we've, when I started, which was about three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, <clears throat> I just fundamentally changed the way we were using it. So it was it was being used as a as a sort of more um, as a more extensive kind of form tool. So its initial use was sort of form first, and then some workflows that enabled that that form or that transaction to be processed. Um, but obviously, that was not remotely scalable. Um, so <clears throat> a lot a lot of work had gone on. Um, before my time on a really small number of apps, which translated as maybe half a dozen transactions that the council does. Um, because Brighton and Hove is unitary, uh, there are something like 700 transactions across the council. So it was just the tip of an iceberg. So um, we fundamentally changed our approach, which is to look at the organization as a whole, end to end, and to be able to cross the whole organization front and back, if you like, um, using Mendix, Boomi, Drupal, um, and, and all the systems we have kind of integrated together. So the use of Mendix um, and, and some of the other technologies allowed us to do that end to end at scale and at speed, um, because the, the design is about all of it, all together, everyone being able to work all together. We couldn't have done that if we hadn't used low code. Okay, excellent. Phil, do you want to sort of expand on that at all? Yeah, so um, so the, the history, because I think you are interested in how it came into the organisation is, I mean, I, our CTO years ago was was interested in low code. But I think it was really only through the digital first programme that was stood up um, and, and ultimately actually moved out from IT and D for a while. Uh, they were the ones responsible for um, procuring and implementing that that low code platform, the integration platform that we later introduced, um, IT and D brought brought in alongside that. And that was about four four years ago, yeah, maybe a bit more now. Um, so we did get involved in sort of the the procurement process and the scoring of it. That's the, that's the, the background history of that. Um, but yeah. Sarah's right. When that program closed down, then those applications were transitioned across back into IT and D for, for support. We realised that um, we weren't going to be able to scale out from there. It was almost like a one-to-one -one relationship between developer and application, which obviously is not scalable. So we, um, you know, as part of the agreement around the funding, the ongoing funding for this, this work. Um, we agreed with the leadership team that whilst we would 
continue some sort of public facing development work, there'd be a lot of work going on in, in the background. We'd be reworking the architecture basically of our applications in the estate, um, making it more modular and more integrated. Um, and that's what we did for about one year. So we did, we did, um, you're all frozen. I hope you can still hear me. Who me? Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, listening, the video, I'm listening. The, the video is all frozen for me, so. All right, sorry. That's all right. Um, yeah, so we did we did position it like that with, within the organisation, and we stuck to that plan. And um, I think it's a good thing that we did because it set us up uh, well for our response when the pandemic hit. And I will ask you a question. I will ask you the next question. Does actually sort of uh, is purely about pandemic. Mark and Andy, obviously, um, you guys have been using Mendix for some time. Um, and do you just, uh, if you do it between, but obviously, uh, I'll come to you first, Mark. What was it? You know, what prompted Nosley to go down this uh, blow code route initially? Um, it was a few different things. Um, I think we we definitely wanted to be able to, um, to to build applications and develop things in-house quicker. Um, we wanted to get closer to the business as well. Uh, there's, there's, there's that really um, that probably overused sort of presentation about the, the bridge between IT and the business. And, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a gulf. Um, and one of the reasons for bringing Mendix in was to, was to try and, you know, reduce the gap between between IT and the business and bring a closer bring us closer together improve the the specifications that we were getting because quite often we we either weren't getting anything or what we were getting was you know we, we would do a lot of work and then suddenly the the goal shifts you know the goals would move and and things would change so trying to solve that problem as well um and and really just trying to accelerate what we were doing um also trying to make sure we, we elim trying to eliminate single points of failure. So um, rather like filter than having a, a one-to-one -one ratio of developer to application, um, try and have it so that a few different people could work on, on the same thing and share the knowledge. Um, and we weren't left in a, a situation where, you know, if somebody wasn't available, that, that we weren't able to make progress on something. So th that's a few reasons why we went down the, the Mendix route. And uh, Andy? Um, I think without going to woe is me story here when austerity hit in 2010 we uh we lost a lot of money in those because we had an awful lot of additional grant funding for various things because of deprivation and a lot of those grants literally dried up immediately uh in the august of 2010 that's how soon those grants very man the election was in may and i'm not going political here at all when i say that uh, so they made a decision that to try and protect frontline services one of the things that we were looking to do the back end services such as the resources department and IT and a number of others took quite a big hit. So we had over the course of about three years, a 50% reduction in budget, 30% reduction in IT staff, which in hindsight wasn't a good thing to do because IT is the actual catalyst to actually transform all the other services and make savings there. That happened anyway. Uh, we managed to secure some money to take on some graduates because we said, look, we can't do any of this development work. People are asking. This was a couple of years into this, by the time we got to 2014, I would say. But what we found was taking on graduates, we had some brilliant graduates working for us, coming out with two ones and firsts, and they were superb. But they were on two-year contracts because we were using temporary funding. And after 15 months, 18 months, they were out the door earning an extra 10 grand a year on top of what we could pay them. And good luck to them, I can't blame them for doing that one. So by the time we'd spent time getting them up to speed and using .NET and C Sharp and stuff, we had six, eight months productivity out of them, then they were out. And as other people have said, people develop in their own way. So I took a punt and said, can we have some more money? Uh, we'd agreed there was going to be a second ch uh, chunk of money. Uh, again, for a two-year period, can we use it for Mendix instead? Well, how are you going to mainstream it? We'll worry about that afterwards. Just take a leap of faith with me, please, and let's try this. Um, and that's where we went to. So we had a look around at various low-code, including out systems. Uh, we went for Mendix, and as Mark says, one of the reasons, and for me, one of the big reasons was 
it was the user interface and the fact that we could actually work with our business areas to say what you actually want it to be. We can storyboard it. We could do sprints. We could just use it in a different way and actually get over that headache of requirement specs. Plus, there wasn't as much training required to get people up to speed and running it. And it was standardizing the code, so it made it easier to support ongoing. So that was how we went down that route. And I don't think we have a look back, to be honest with you. It is now mainstreamed. Um, we started off by anybody who wanted development doing had to pay an amount of money per year for their little container. Um, and that worked out okay. We then, for all the customer services stuff, which we went from about 3% to 84% in four years, we hit 75% online transactions for the contact center and one-stop shop services within three years. Um, all of that became mainstream funded. We were given money to fund that because they realized what a difference it had made and so quickly. So I mean, it's, uh, it's quite interesting that, you know, you've, you, you've both gone down this this low code route, and and um, for both of you, it's now it, it's almost like sort of default. It's the foundation for your sort of moving forward, the entire organisation moving forward for transformation and for you know sort of enabling digital services and that sort of thing. Just can we get an idea of from both of you? And we'll start with uh, Mark and Andy. How many how how many actual processes um, or apps have you created? Within the Mendix platform, I'll defer to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> approximately, you know. Appro approximately. Um, well, we we we've got um, we've got twelve Mendix apps within the organisation, um, and within those there are I I, I would say we, we're probably into hundreds of processes now that, that are running through the various different um, various different applications that we've got. I can't give you an exact number today, but I, I would I would say hundreds. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of a lot of information, a lot of data, um, and, and a lot of processes that are that are passing through them. And are you are you able to attach a sort of a time saving or a cost saving? Because obviously, you know, a lot of people are looking at low code not only as a way of sort of bringing back control over their sort of transformation journeys, but also looking at sort of you know getting rid of sort of some of these point solutions that they could create. You know, they they could create apps and solutions for themselves. Have you sort of done any sort of uh, exercise in maybe quantifying what it's helped you save over the period that you've been using it? We did. We haven't sort of decommissioned very much software. There are two or three actually on the booking side that Mark can cover off. But our online offer was predominantly for web forms that people could fill in, and sometimes we would get fed straight into a dip system as though it was a paper form. Right. Uh, but there was there was secondary keying basically on nearly all of them, so we've done away with all of that. But what we haven't done is quantified where those savings are. If I'm honest with you, it was just a relief to some of the back end services that they didn't have to do it anymore. But that was a piece of work we probably should have done but didn't. But there are some of the booking areas that we used to have a Sephora for that we're no longer using, but they're not massive savings on that point. I think. Mm because we've gone down this route of austerity and a lot of services have cut staff down to the bone, I wouldn't say it necessarily made savings. It took, just took the pressure off pressure, the whereas yeah. they've gone too low. To be honest, we all went too low on the number of staff that we've given up uh, and I actually made it manageable. A good example is, so we, we launched um, an MOT bookings app this week, actually. It, it went live on, um, went live on Monday and um, as Andy said, that's that's replaced a, a third party system. One of the one of the benefits of, of us doing it is that we've been able to integrate it directly into the back office system, and so the information that comes in from the booking is, is pushed straight through to the back end. Um, that's that saves the back office an awful lot of time, uh, an awful lot of headaches. Um, so it so it improves the quality for them, improves the quality of the customer service, uh, and just creates a better overall result for everybody. Um, and it also puts a foundation in place to build on. Uh, I know that, that that part of the service is really keen to push on and bring more, bring more integrations in. Um, so, you know, there's there's the question about quantifying time savings, etc. But I think it's as much about um, improving the quality of the service. You know, there's 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 fewer people, so you know, there's there's fewer staff employed, um, and it, and it's about getting those to 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 maximise their output. And one of the ways that we can do that is to 
is to automate some of the processes and, and just streamline everything to let people get on and do do the things that they need to do. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Uh, same question to, to to you guys at Brighton, Sarah and Phil. Um, you know, you've obviously been using it for some time, but then obviously, you know, Sarah's come in and over three years so you've been there, Sarah. Um, how many sort of apps or processes do you think you guys have have low coded and improved? Uh, well, we took us, as I say, I, I took a slightly different approach, which is um, making less individual apps doing more things. So we have one app, which is the which is the main contact system for all of the transactions. Pretty much, we have a few standalone Minix apps, but the vast majority are rooted into contact management. Um, the way we did that is to use uh, Drupal Drupal forms on the front end, and that data is pushed through into the Mendix um, app, uh, and that and there we're able to handle all the workflows. So that that one app handles um, currently about 300 individual forms, um, and then all of the workflows that hang off that. So that that is one Mendix app. I right, got you. Um, wow. But then we also, because we, we took a more kind of data first approach. Um, so concurrently, we've also been building up our core indices. So we have a property index and a person index. Um, so when a submission happens into our environment, we can call the index and return back where relevant subjects for GDPR um, and take that information to the staff member who is processing it. So if it's safeguarding, we can we can call that index and the systems to say this person is already known to social services or is already known to another service area. Um, and then we do have some other apps that like we we have uh, my account, which is basically a series of bolted together apps. Um, so we we are passing um, users from one app to another so that each individual app is service specific. So all of our parking services are now in a Mendix environment. Uh, school admissions, um, all of the kind of rubbish and recycling and the My Account Core is, is kind of like the middle unit with, with the sort of login and credentials and then we're just using um, like SAML and OAuth to pass them, pass them over into kind of council tax and so on. So it allows us to kind of scale up. So, Brilliant. and are you uh, just, just are you two? So are you two? Are uh, Nosley and Brian then? Are you able to share this stuff? Are you potentially able to? Does does some does some sort of medium exist where? <laughs> Will we, will we be able we, to share it? We have, yeah. yeah, we haven't explored that yet. And of course, you know, as I'm sure many people on the call know, you know, local authority systems differ considerably between local authorities. Um, so uh, what we're integrating with will differ. So it requires some, some reworking. But it's something we've, we are increasingly thinking about, actually. Yeah, because, you know, you, you're both doing... You're both creating again. Use that sort of smart empty box analogy. If you are both potentially creating different things, you should be able to, you know, be able to share them somewhere. And even if they're not a hundred percent right, even if they're only seventy-five percent right for the for the other organisation, they've got to do some other stuff because they're using the same platform to develop. They've only got twenty-five percent to develop instead of the whole hundred percent. I wonder if that's a uh, that's there is the means to actually share code within Mendix uh, between sites, so that is technically possible, yes. Right, uh, okay. I, I can't necessarily speak for Brighton. I think our head's just been down saying how much of this can we get through. Right. We've done our large app, which covers everything yes. that goes through the contact centre and one-stop shop. Right. It's about every type of transaction from housing benefits through to all sorts of stuff. Things right. like okay. planning and social care aren't on there for us. Uh, but we've just had a head down plan through those, but there are things that we can do. And we have done some work across the city region recently, so that tied in really. Yeah, brilliant. Well, so, I mean, uh, just leading on to, because obviously we've, we've spent the last 14 months in, everyone's been in pandemic mode uh, and, and local authorities 
certainly all the local authorities I've been speaking to over virtually, you know, virtual events. And that's the thing, you know, um, the overwhelming sort of message has been from most people that, you know, there's been this sort of, it's, it's been one of the best times to work within a local authority because everyone's been focusing on delivering almost like the same, the same thing, although it's been tiring. So in, in some cases, people just found it like sort of just continuous agile sprints in creating funding applications and, and you know, sort of volunteering forms and, and all the stuff that's required for shielding and that sort of thing. So I, I, I'll ask you guys at Brighton first, you know, um, how did, did, did having a low-code agile platform, I'm, I'm assuming that it, it sort of made your response to the pandemic, and I'm assuming it made it a far I'll, I'll say easier is probably not the right word, but it, it made it. You were able yeah, to respond quicker. <laughs> well, yeah, you were able to respond in a in a more agile way because you had control of it. So you know, it, you know, your 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 response to the pandemic did 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 having a low code platform, you know, did it did it support it or did it hamper it? No, um, video is all gone right now, so I'm looking at a black screen, but I will. Carry on, anyway. Um, We're still here. We're still here. Yeah. Um, without without a doubt, you know, and the architecture that, that Sarah just described with um, Drupal forms being integrated into that Mendix um, backend, if you like, the contact management system was definitely instrumental in that. So we're able to have different elements of the development team working on um, the sort of front end and the back end and delivering extremely quickly so requests for help forms ppe request forms um business grants forms was not um drupal solution that was pure mendix but uh, you know absolutely couldn't have turned it around as quickly as we did without a that foundation work that we described earlier and and b having low code platforms in place for sure yeah and mark andy yeah, same same story. Um, I think one of the benefits from us was because we had that core team of people who were used to lo using the low code product. Um, it, it was it was very easy to bring other people from the team in to to build extra fun functionality as it was required. Um, so that was that was incredibly beneficial. Um, and like Phil says, yeah, we we were able to get things done done very quickly that that were required of us and. Um, the, the, the loco platform was was a big part of that. I I would say, yeah, I would say that I don't think we would have done anywhere near what we managed to do without the loco platform uh, within you know, a matter of a week. I think we actually had something up that would match requests for assistance with volunteers who were saying we can assist and third sector organisations. I mean, that wasn't a week of nine to five, take bear in mind, Mark and the team were working ridiculously long hours. And when we came to the business grants, um, the other authorities in Liverpool City Region, the six local authorities in there were struggling and they said, can you do it in Mendix? Can you do low codes? We, all of those grants we did for all of the authorities and we had one portal that we went on to and that just worked for everybody. So the whole city regions benefited from it. Um, and it, again, that means we weren't duplicating, to be honest. We could do one solution very quickly that everybody could use, and then we could squirt files out to go into the systems wherever they were going to use them. So, yeah, we wouldn't have done it without, I'll be honest. And then, Sarah, any additional comments the use of the low code, low code during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, it literally wouldn't have been possible. Um, you would have just... Uh, well, some of our services were proposing um, doing things by phone and spreadsheet. Um, I mean, I mean, honestly, it's <laughs> just been absolute carnage. Yeah, I, I don't really know what would have happened if we hadn't had that um, stack already. So, uh, so what's the, what? What are both? And I'll, I'll 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 ask you, Sarah and Phil, first. What is your vision for the future? And I guess the future being, uh, I mean, at the moment we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, we're in recovery, aren't we? They talk about we're in this recovery period, which, you know, potentially um, the new health minister said something like, you know, July the 9th potentially is uh, maybe when 
we can all go back to normal, whatever, whatever that is. Um, so what does, the, what does the future hold for Brighton with regards to mm. the use of the platform? Um, well, I, I mean, uh, as I said, what uh, the approach, the, the sort of design architectural approach has been to try and do all of it a bit end to end and it effectively lift the whole organisation up a rung and then loop back round and do the whole thing again up a rung. Um, I felt that that, you know, one of the biggest complaints that people have is that uh, they tell one service and another service doesn't know something or no one gets back to them. So to solve that problem, it felt like the only way to do that was do it end to end once. So um, a low code pr platform obviously gives you the opportunity to keep iterating. So sort of grabbing everything all together and then lift the whole lot up again and keep going up again. So that, that's the approach we've taken. Um, the, the pandemic obviously meant that we stopped, um, let, uh, to be frank, stopped arguing with all of the services that this would be better ways of working. So there was no other way of working. So that did help. Uh, also what helped is there were a lot less people. Um, the, the dev team were <laughs> working obviously crazy hours, but uh, there was a lot less uh, people in services. So actually decisions got made much faster and things got executed much faster. And, um, and that's given further opportunities to kind of expand on that stake in the ground really and keep moving it forward. Um, we, as a team, we took the view that we, we sort of, rather than being like a delivery team to the organization, we're setting the strategy. So even, so we're kind of pushing out rather than just sort of reacting. And I think that made a big difference. So it is really just building on that. Brilliant. Um, and Nosley, Mark, Andy. I think we'll carry on with a lot of the stuff we're doing. I think Brighton and Hove have got a clearer vision of where they are with a lot of this than we have, to be honest with you. But what we have noticed is that the work that we've done over the pandemic, our focus was we had to address contact centre and one-stop shops. That's why all of this came in. Um, that was the big driver back three, four years ago. People have seen the success there, but they've also, and heard about that one, but they've also seen what's happened over the last 15, 18 months and are saying, actually, can I have a slice of that one? And more and more services want now a higher online presence. So we're actually going through a piece of work at the moment on the recovery cycle and what people want to do coming out of the new, to, into the new normal, because normal will not be what it was 18 months ago, it will be a new normal. And that new normal will have a lot more online. So there'll be a lot more use of Mendix, I'm quite sure of that. Brilliant. Mark, anything to add? Can't lip read. I think he's lost audio. Yeah. You've, lost, you've lost audio. All right. Do you want to, can you do, do you want to do sign language or uh, interpretive dance? No. <laughs> um, I, I believe Ho Hovik. Do you want to Hovik? Do you want to unmute and put your camera on? And because you've got some questions, I'd like to be interested to. Yes, thank you. you. Right. I, I just couldn't find the raise hand function. Not a problem, uh, Hovik. Not a um, problem. Uh, yes, a couple of questions. Um, so low code by definition means some coding. So I just wanted to ask those who have been using Mendix, have you come across? Uh, you know what what language, if any, there is within Mendix? And have you come across any limitations such as trying to integrate to other applications such as, you know, waste systems or anything like that? That's, that's to any of you. Feel free to chip in. Yeah, um, okay, I could chip in. <laughs> um, the, more, the more complex the architecture that we developed, the more skilled developers we required. I mean, there's, yes. Um, um, obviously, to, to make um, uh, some of the initial, some of those initial applications, um, it was relatively quick to skill up non-developers into being able to do that. Um, some of the more complicated apps um, 
we have developers in our team that wouldn't be able to support those apps. So, um, so I think it really would depend on how you were using it. Um, a lot. Um, I think from our side, the lessons learned really is that a lot of it hangs on the design and architecture before starting to build. So a lot of the skill is in that. Um, it's very easy to spin something up very quickly, but not necessarily scale that up for future use. So we do rely on some very experienced developers in-house to do that alongside the design. Um, can't really comment much on the degree of hand coding. Maybe Mark will be in a better position to give you an idea of that. But in terms of integration, so we have done some quite considerable integrations from within Mendix itself, but also um, we have a, an integration platform called Boomi. Um, and we, we use that, we take that approach really where particularly where we know there's a, a process that we are likely to share across other applications. Um, obviously we use the platform for a, for a multiple um, different use cases, integration use cases, but um, you know, in the, like I say, in the context of Mendix, we do abstract out some of those integrations and use Boomi for that. And does that answer your question, Ovi? Yes, yes, it does. And one last question. How widely is Mendix used amongst local authorities? Do we know? Brian, anyone from Mendix? What was the question? How widely is it used? Yes, yes. Um, how many amongst, amongst public sector and local government. Uh, depends what you mean in terms of a number of apps, provisioned apps that are running. Number of customers. Organisations. Oh, I'll have to get back onto you there, but I know for th on our MX, on our Mendix cloud, where um, a lot of our customers, I think our latest count, we, we by sector, I think that we've got over a thousand customers. Generally, uh, they've provisioned up something like over seven thousand apps that are provisioned on our, our cloud platform, and that's just people running on our cloud. So then to actually overlay users, I think like Gary was saying earlier, they've got 8,000 internal users, that's at one. So if you think about that, I wouldn't know, maybe Phil or Sarah, you've got a better number of the number of users that are using Mendix apps within your organizations. No, I think I think Hovit was asking about you know individual customers. So you've got Brian and Hovit knows the under call. Oh, so, sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we've got about nine or ten, I think. Mm -hmm. Customers mm -hmm. in the UK. Yeah, local authorities. We've got central government. We've got the cabinet office uh, as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Well. healthcare as well. Sorry, okay. Nigel. And healthcare. And healthcare, yeah. Got, oh, yeah, and healthcare, yeah. We've got five organisations in the healthcare. Yeah. So we're sort of slowly but surely coming to the end of the session. So I wanted to just ask um, all the panellists. Um, it's, it's so I've, I've been sort of doing these sort of events and activities for the last 21 years, you know, ever since Tony Blair started the modernising government agenda. It seems like a... It seems like a lifetime. Well, it is a lifetime. Um, <laughs> and it will carry on until I get, I get my uh, lottery numbers up on a Friday. Um, but, and so, you know, I've seen, I've seen lots of technologies, probably like lots of you that have been working in local authorities around sort of tech and that sort of thing. But in low code and this sort of local government as platform approach, I almost see it as a no brainer. It, you know, the, the, the benefits of, of adopting a low code strategy the, the, the you know the benefits just seem to outweigh any sort of particular issues especially with you know people saying well you're putting all your eggs in one basket and that sort of thing um so i'd like to i'd like to ask all of my mm. panelists um you know what what you see is the sort of you know the, the the key the key sort of things that you've come the barriers that you've come up against when when trying to sort of uh, sell low code into your organization? Because I, th I think the benefits, you know, a lot of them are obvious, but what are, you know, why aren't, why isn't everyone using low code? 
That, I guess. Why aren't all local authorities all of a sudden moving to loco? Because moving forward out of this pandemic, there's going to be more, I, I, you know, I guess there's going to be more austerity. Um, and there's going to be more of a need to sort of automate and get technology to do heavy lifting. And we're seeing a lot of people investing in RPA and conversational AI and, and a number of these sort of automation technologies. So, you know, why is it that more local authorities aren't using low code? Um, Sarah, I'm going to come to you. Uh, well, I'd say some of the challenges, like I said, are definitely to do with the design. It's a bit like giving somebody word and saying, why don't you make a, uh, you know, best-selling novel? You, you, it isn't <clears throat> just enough just to have a platform. You sort of have to know where it's going. And I think um, it, it can be quite easy just to kind of fixate on perfecting what represents a very tiny percentage of that organisation's function. Um, I think when you're talking about a massive organisation like a council with so many completely different things that it does, it one of the things that was the issue for Digital First is trying to exactly represent the ROI on the time spent. So you say, well, we spent you know, two years making these three apps and they've saved us uh, some thousands of pounds, but the organisation is looking at millions in deficit. Yeah. So the cost of Mendix starts to become a difficult thing to sell because, because the, um, um, the amount that it costs and the, and the gain that you're trying to tr trade off has to be sort of planned in quite well. Otherwise, you could spend the time and not realise the gain. And if you don't get the stuff done fast enough, in the eyes of the organisation, they start to wonder why that money is being spent. Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge we had definitely, trying to do things at pace to show the value so we could come back round again and get it better. And uh, Phil? Yeah, I think um, also as a, um, a manager of a development function or, you know, the strategy around that, if you weren't, if you didn't already have some exposure and heard, you know, things like, like what we're hearing today, you might be, be quite wary of going down that route in terms of bringing in the appropriate skills. You know, as Sarah mentioned earlier, I think it's really, it, well, certainly at Brighton, it's been really key to have um, skilled Mendix developers from the get-go. Um, and, you know, where, where, have you, where you've got .NET development and, and Java development, there's a multitude of people out there with those skills. People with low-code development skills, you can't just just pick up off the street right. and bring them into yeah. your organisation. So there may be some some reticence there. I I think you know perhaps a general attitude towards low-code in general might shift increasingly now with like RPA products that you mentioned, Nick. Um, there are several out there that are you know low-code solutions which I think a lot of organizations are perhaps adopting ahead of low code development platforms. Um, so you may start, start to see more of a shift in attitude towards low code in general. Mm. Yeah, good point. Good point. Andy? I think for us, we, were, we started from this position of having cut back so much that, and there was a recognition that we needed to move forward. Um, so we tried to bring developers in and do it traditional methods and that wasn't working so there was a there was a leap of faith in there it has proved itself uh we started differently to brighton and hove because it was let's take some of these dumb forms and actually make them into interactive forms that are populating back-end systems uh so the technical need wasn't quite as high at that point for us but we could actually um demonstrate a really quick response and a benefit almost immediately from this one and you know what we turned over in that first two three years was was amazing in that sense from my point of view we've got very happy customers because they love working with mendix and working with us and they can see the benefits they can see what's happening because they can be involved in it with a storyboard and so that makes that takes the pressure off them they're not having to second guess the art of the possible and it's what you want or what can you do that question is <clears throat> It, it overcomes that one because we can do a little bit if you can do that does that mean we can have that yes you can and it opens up and we've now actually got a much better dialogue 
maybe that was because we weren't asking the right questions. I don't know, but we've got a really good dialogue there. Um, there's potentially going to be a, a significant saving coming out of what we've done, which I can't talk about right now because um, it's not been through politicians yet, but there could be a very significant saving to Nosley in what we've achieved in that we'll make a massive return on the investment here, more than, more than uh, what we're paying out, certainly. So I also think that the staff working on it, you know, the developers are really happy as well, generally. We've got a lot less turnover of staff in the development side. And they're turning things out and having happy customers, giving them praise and stuff. Right. So to me, it just works every mm. which way because they're feeling it's a job, job well done and people are liking what we're doing. And that gives them job satisfaction. Yeah, and maybe they're not doing .NET and Java coding anymore, but they get the same amount of job satisfaction in my view. Mark's closer to that team than I am, but that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I'd agree with Andy on that. Uh, uh, churn is... Is really low for a for a development team, um, and I think it is that uh, you know seeing your your work out there so much more rapidly and appreciated by the business, recognised by the business. Would you agree with that, Mark? Um, if if you can hear me, I would yes, agree with that. Yeah, hooray! Woo. Hey. Um, the best, probably mm. the best, the best evidence I can give you is that. Um, I, I did a couple of job interviews yesterday for a one-year post and was able to offer a, a young guy who's in his early 20s the chance to come and build some systems with us uh, and learn how that works. And he was absolutely like over the moon. Um, he was really excited about coming and joining us. So um, I, I think, yeah, really high job satisfaction. As Andy says, the, the team meetings are great because everybody is is enjoying what they're doing. You know, they get the good feedback. Um they get a chance to work with customers and, and kind of understand, you know, their pressures and their needs and wants and, and respond to that. And, you know, we've, we've got a really good, a really good system in place. And, you know, some of it is about the technology platform and some of it is also about the, the kind of the, the creative environment that it allows um, and people, you know, people in the organization, both the IT developers and also the, the people working in the business and at the coalface, they respond to that. So, yeah, um, I, I'd agree with everything that the, the other panelists have said. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, does anyone else have any further questions for any of our panellists before we finish slightly early so we can all run to the betting shop or pub or home? Um, any observations? Any? Oh, someone's... Mike Ward, you put your hand... Make sure it's not too long a, a, a question, Mike. Otherwise, you become very unpopular. Oh, OK, then. Um, I've, I, <laughs> it's the, Something that a number of things I've heard today is about um, integration platforms or integration layers. And something that was occurring to me um, recently is, is with hindsight, having used a low-code platform for uh, a year now and attempted a number of sort of point-to-point -point integrations, what, what are people's views on actually creating, um, you know, an integration piece of middleware in .NET, for example, so that you can use all of the the full power of .NET to do all the, the tricky integrations, as, as Nigel um, called them earlier, um, on behalf, if you like, of the, of the low-code platform so that you only have one, one um, endpoint to integrate with for all of your integrations. You know, what other people would just be interested to see what other people think about that. Anyone? Mark, go on. Do you want to have a go first? Um, I think if you've got I think if you've got the people to do that, um, I, I think that's a really good idea. If you if you can get it, get them all into one place, then uh, yeah, why not? Sarah, Bill. Um, well, I. Oh, I'm going to talk at the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can go ahead. Fine. Uh, we well, we use Boomi. Basically, for our integrations, so we, which is low code, we're low, low, it's a rad um, mm. integration solution. So we're basically bolting those things together. So we okay. can develop the booming processes independently of the Mendix um, app. So we have concurrent development that's sort of reusable. That, that's yeah. our approach. <laughs> okay. Hey, right, Mike. <laughs> Mike, is that it? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. Answers you. No, question. that was that was my sort of um, um, burning question. Yeah, yeah, that's all. 
Oh, brilliant. So I might, to... might attempt something like that and, and, and move our integrations over to a, a you know, integration facade rather than attempting various point-to-point -point integrations at some point. Excellent. Well, you know where to, you know the people to go to when you, when everything topples over. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, right. Well, if we've got no more questions, then, um, Yes, I am mindful that uh, the clock ticks on. I'd like to thank Phil and Sarah from sunny Brighton. I hope it's sunny down there. It should be this time of year. Uh, for, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Andy from a very bright Nosley and Mark from a, a snow swept Nosley. Uh, also, Kieran and Garion, who's still on the call. Garion, good to see you and thank you very much for stepping in. Uh, great, a great bit of content. Um, and yeah, I'm still. I'm still banging my head as to why pe more people aren't going down the low code route, and hopefully that will change. Um, the recordings will be the recording will be online. I'll sort it out possibly tomorrow morning after the football. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for getting involved. <laughs> um, much appreciated. Great content. I will be sharing it uh, with you all. But have a wonderful evening. Yep. Uh, and to the two Welshmen uh, that were, I think they've gone now, haven't they? Um, oh no, you're still there. I, I, you're still, you're still there. I, I, I could sense the bitterness in the room. Um, yeah. so anyway, is, is that because Wales always exit early, Nick? That's right. Well, oh. watch, how it's, watch how it's done this evening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of jinx it now by saying, watch how it's done this evening. Um, I can imagine a French set. I, I can imagine